Welcome everyone to our new Urban Purpose Report launch. The presentation will begin shortly. If you have any questions for us along the way, please use the Q&A window in Zoom, not the chat window, use the Q&A window, please. And we will end the presentation with a short Q&A session. So questions in the Q&A window, please. All right, everyone, welcome, welcome. So my name is Kasper Petersen. I am the head of publications at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. And presenting for you today, if you can change the slide, Lasse. Hello, everyone from Zagreb, from England, from Brighton from Beirut and from central Copenhagen. <laughs> Welcome everyone. All right, there we go. There we are. So my name is Kasper Petersen and I'm here today with Lasse Jonasson and Nikolaj Zweistrup. Uh, Nikolaj Zweistrup is an associated partner here at the Institute and Lasse is a director and futurist. And these two gentlemen also make up two thirds of the lead writing team behind the new Urban Purpose Report, as well as our newly launched Urban Futures initiatives, which they will tell you much more about in a minute. But before we get to that, a few words about the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. We are a not-for-profit think tank located in Denmark. Our main goal is to improve organizational decision-making through future studies and strategic foresight. And we do this in a number of different ways. One is that we act as advisors for businesses and organizations in various sectors and industries, both public and private. And in essence, we help these organizations apply principles from future studies and strategic foresight in uh, their work to improve their strategic outlook and to improve their decision making about the future. We also host talks and courses designed for people to sort of dip their toes into the world of strategic foresight and how to apply it in their own work. Uh, we have an upcoming course in early June, which you can read more about on our website www.cifs.dk. We will share a link to this toward the end of the presentation. Um, finally, we also publish four major scenario reports each year available in our shop and to members of the Institute. Uh, these reports engage with um, mega trends and other topics of broad global relevance for societies, businesses, and individuals. And you can browse all of our reports and purchase them as well. If you go to cifs.dk slash shop, again, we will provide you with a link towards the end of the presentation. So the newest of these report is the one we will be talking about today. It's called New Urban Purpose, and it's divided into three parts, covering three major questions for the future of cities worldwide. And these, these questions are as follows. The first one is, why will we choose to live in cities in the future? The second question is, how will future cities be led and governed? And the third question is whether regenerative cities are possible. And if you're asking yourself, what does regenerative even mean? Well, um, and what does it have, it have to do with cities? Uh, I promise it will all be made clear to you in a minute. Uh, finally, this report launch coincides with the launch of our new Urban Futures Initiative headed by Nikolai and Lasse, the presenters today, and they will tell you much more about uh, much more about that in a minute as well. And uh, again, link to that <laughs> towards the end of the presentation, so you can go check it out on our website and see for yourself. So without further introduction, 
uh, my colleague Lasse will now get into the first question of the day. That is, why will we choose to live in cities in the future? And he will also give you our take on um, both what will make cities uh, attractive places to live in the future, but also more generally, why and how can we use future studies to understand our urban futures? So take it away, Lasse. Thank you, Casper. And um, I will start answering the question why we will live in the futures um, uh, in, in the cities in the future by asking another question and that is how will the cities of the future look like and first of all um, they will be larger as we see on this slide we are um, at this very moment in a unique time in in a point in time where for for, for first time in history the population in rural areas will actually start to decline. That means that more than 100% of the population on a global level will come from urban, uh, from, from cities. And uh, as you also see here, that will uh, mean that we will have a number of extremely large mega cities, where we uh, um, by 2050 expect to have the, the cities you see here, Lagos, Kinshasa, Delhi, etc., they will be more than twice the size as we see uh, um, the largest cities uh, today. So first of all, we will see a huge increase in population size that will also push towards the dimensions of uh, the, the social dimensions, the economic dimensions, and not at least the environmental dimensions. So we have major challenges uh, we need to approach over the coming years towards 2050. And not only are the, the cities changing in size, in size, they're also changing inside. Uh, and this is what we call the transition of the urban purpose, which uh, is also the, the headline of the re report. We see um, the way we work are uh, under transition that means that the reason for going into the city the reason for traveling around in the city are suddenly changing the consumption patterns are changing not only um what we buy but also how we buy it we've seen during the the covid19 uh um pandemic a major shift towards online uh trade we have um We've, we've just uh, about to launch a report on the future of retail where we look into that topic and some of our analysis points towards a decline between 30 and 70 percent of uh, of consumption uh, from the physical uh, um, um, retail we also see a major change within the mobility dimension we believe that the future of mobility will be electrified autonomous and also shared. So this will mean that we are moving around in different ways. And it, it's, it's, it's not only about how we move around, it's also about the, the purpose of moving around because for first, uh, uh, suddenly we, we, we see a change where it's no longer us that are traveling around necessarily. We can also have things traveling to us and also the, the experienced cost of traveling will change when you do not have to sit and be wary aware of, of the road if you are driving a car, et cetera. And the, 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 the fourth dimension we also see in transition is communication. So uh, first of all, we all know that the way we communicate, just the way we, we have this uh, webinar uh, is being digitized. Uh, but it's not only about our existing behavior being digitized, it's also about how we start to communicate with the city around us. Uh, we are um, going towards a future where we will have uh, Internet of Things devices all over the city, meaning that it's not only about 
human to human um, communication. It's about human to machine communication. We will communicate with the city around us. It will respond and that will also change our behavior. So what we see is actually four major dimensions causing a change in why we're moving around in the cities, how we're moving around in the cities, basically the purpose of moving around in the cities. And our experience when working with future studies is that the, the, the benefit is, uh, is um, greatest when we are working with topics where we see radical changes. Because when we see radical changes, it's no longer sufficient to look at where we are today, put some trends um, into perspective, and then foresee where we are going tomorrow. Now, we're seeing uh, um, uh, a number of vectors that are changing at the same time. They are influencing uh, um, uh, the cities at the same time. They're creating a number of uncertainties. Hence, we also see that there are several plausible futures. And that's where um, we advise that you start looking at the development in a more structured way than just extrapolating uh, the, the current environment by using trends. Um, usually at, at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, we use this approach, which uh, we have also trademarked and called it the Copenhagen method. Um, there are several approaches to look more structured into the future. Um, the last report, uh, scenario report we launched was about how to use the future where we explain some of the methodologies we use. And we also have a course uh, uh, focused on, on this exact me methodology. But very briefly, the way we approach the future is by starting to look at the future society. We start looking uh, from the outside in. It's not only about understanding uh, uh, the current needs of the consumers, it's about understanding the future needs. We do that by looking at the mega trends, the major drivers of change, how they are changing on a societal level. Because first, when you understand the changes on societal level, you can uh, look more narrowly on the transactional environment, the industry you're operating in. For example, if you're working in the mobility industry, uh, one thing is understanding the electrification, the automation, et cetera, of your industry. But another thing is actually understanding why people want to move around in the future, what they want to move around, uh, uh, why they want to move around and the, and the purpose of their travel. So we start from the outside and we, we, um, we focus on a more and more narrow perspective. We build scenarios based on the uncertainties we face. And then uh, you could argue from a philosoph philosoph <laughs> philosophical point of view, um, we say there are no uh, determined future, not one. There are several plausible futures. So if you are an actor in the future cities, you need to prepare for several plausible futures uh, in order to have a resilient strategy. Um, I won't dig more into that, but there was just a side um, note to, to say that we need to look at this on a structured point of view. So back to the main question, uh, why we want to live in the cities in the future. Again, why have we chosen to live in the cities in the current, uh, um, currently? Historically, we see that uh, the key driver for urbanization was actually the industrialization. Uh, there was a, a, a move to more, towards uh, efficiency because by, by moving people closer together, you could help them uh, uh, create a market space where they could trade. You could help them uh, uh, be closer to the factories, be closer to the consumption, be closer to their job. Uh, etc. So um, historically, and this is a very brief history, history but uh, historically, uh, it has been uh, a, a, a search for for um, um, the pursuit for efficiency that has been driven, uh, that has driving uh, urbanization. So can we expect this development to continue? 
basically what I have been mentioning earlier is that we see a, a, a digitization of a lot of our behavior. So living close to your job in the future will no more be as important as it was historically. Also, as I said, you don't need to be close to uh, the marketplace in order to do your, your, uh, your groceries that can be delivered to you. Uh, a lot of the companies, um, the major companies are working towards a, a hybrid working model and, and we see a continual digitization of our behavior. So all things equal, the force of urbanization in terms of the pursuit for efficiency will not be as strong in the future as it has been. The question is then, will we see a de-urbanization because of this? Um, we won't serve you the answer right now, but we say that we actually will see other forces being stronger as well. Uh, livability is what we uh, um, we look into and see as a driving force for urbanization. What is livability? Um, according to World Economic Forum, a livable city is a, a city that is environmental, sustainable, it's uh, focused on safety and social connectivity, and it provides uh, uh, access to quality life services for its citizens. So a new, uh, um, a new force is, is uh, being brought into play here. Um, and we, we foresee, if we look at this, uh, this fellow sitting here, um, we believe that he will uh, uh, appreciate access to seamless asset life and a connected life. For him, the, the, the flexibility perspective will be extremely important. Living a life where he has uh, access to a number of different choices uh, throughout the day will be very important for him. He will grow up being used to not uh, have to order his dinner before half an hour. Uh, be, half an hour before he, he actually wants to eat, be, before he gets hungry. Uh, and, and when he's used to that, uh, he, he will have difficulties moving away from that. And why is that, that we will only have those services in the cities? It's because in order to provide uh, these different shared services uh, um, provided by the sharing economy, you need to live in dense areas. Um, so we believe that um, people uh, getting used to these very tailored uh, seamless services, they will have difficulties moving away, uh, moving to rural areas, uh, because that will be like moving away from, from uh, the, the, uh, the service level they have been used to. A subset of this livability is the health. We also believe that health um, is, um, is, will be a strong driver for people, people in the cities in the future. As I uh, explained previously, industrialization has been a moving force for, um, for urbanization, uh, but that has been when you, 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 previously you had to compromise with your own health when you moved to the cities because of the pollution, because of the, uh, um, the general uh, uh, worsening of living conditions. But tomorrow, we believe this is going to change. Uh, cities will move towards more predictive healthcare uh, by, as we see on the picture here, in, in um, enabling the physical environment to interact with the, with the people, the citizens. So you will be uh, not towards using these kind of trampolines, uh, using it when you are moving around in the cities, it will be connected with also the, the smart devices I mentioned earlier. So you will be able to be uh, um, followed and notched around in the city uh, um, and, and basically uh, uh, living a more healthy life. And this is not only about the physical life, it's also about the mental health. For example, uh, we do believe that the cities will have uh, incentives to, to uh, maintain the health of their citizens, uh, both from economical, but also from, from social uh, point of view. For example, uh, um, um, 
focusing on loneliness. And that will be a solution we believe will be uh, uh, better provided in cities than the rural areas. So the conclusion here is that future cities will provide more livable and healthier lives to their citizens. That was it for, for the first part. And now we'll do a, a, a very uh, non-digital switch to, uh, to uh, Nikolai. Thank you very much, Lasse. I just do the digital. Lasse is a bit taller than me. Like this. Uh, when we live in cities in, in the future, as uh, Les is talking about, uh, it will always also be the place that, where we have to, to make the change in how we actually live uh, in connection to the rest of the planet. We have uh, been taking a look into uh, how we see the future of the cities and one of the topics we found is that we have to go further than sustainability as we talk a lot about today. The next level um, we, uh, we talk about and, and, and see we have to go towards is the regenerative uh, cities. Uh, the idea is uh, with the regenerative cities that everything are connected and what we do, all we do, do no harm, but makes a positive impact on the planetary balance. I'll come back to that one. Uh, in the search, we have uh, read a lot of things and in the book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, Bill Gates uh, compares our climate to a bathtub. Uh, that is slowly filling up uh, with water. And uh, even if you slow the influence inflow to, to a trigger, the top will eventually uh, still uh, fill up and at last spill over. So uh, the essence also in the, this way we think of the regenerative cities, uh, we need just to slow down the pace uh, to, uh, and not only to slow down, but actually start to, to uh, empty um, the top. So over the next years, uh, we here in the, at the Institute, we, uh, we like to explore how to make a shift from sustainability to more regenerative systems from this damage reduction as we see today to more value optimization uh, and how that would evolve. And also what we need today to make decisions that can improve the future uh, thinking of uh, regenerative solutions. So the question is, can we move forward from sustainability and reduction of uh, impact to creating an urban space by building that uh, regenerative, um, uh, provide more than they take? Well, we, uh, we have in the report make uh, a lot of features as you uh, uh, can see one of them here. Uh, one of the issues is that when we talk about the, the uh, regenerative cities, that is that we actually right now is on the movement. Uh, when you see here, a lot, of, a lot of us still are at the conventional consuming and deleting part over in the, in the red spot. Um, but we are moving over to trying to do today, do no harm in the sustainable way. But um, uh, we want to see that can we actually fix the harm and in the end, if we're going to be uh, regenerative, can we uh, create a positive uh, impact on, on how we live together with the nature? Uh, so, um, well, Les and I, we can talk a lot uh, about uh, this uh, uh, movement, uh, and uh, we would love to do that uh, to talk to you over a digital cup of coffee. Uh, the sense here is uh, that we, we try to uh, evolve and, and uh, speed up uh, the new thinking. Well, when we talk about the cities, uh, the regenerative city has a focus on the system and everything is that connected the builds on the principle that the whole is uh, greater than the sum of the parts. Um, it's the vision of the city, uh, which is made of uh, interconnected flows of energy and resource use and reuse that operate in, in symbiotic uh, loops and uh, they are connected at all scales and uh, within change rather than uh, undermine the natural ecosystems from which the city draws in the uh, sustenance and the uh, energy. So they get actually have to all the way with we have food and we have everything is in the city and uh, of course uh, in the close center land. But what we are talking about here is also that uh, imagine at being a part of this leave the nature better that state than in when we took it over and uh, I'd, I'd just like you all to stop up and think a moment can you say no to this 
and uh, I do hope that you you cannot. Um, but one of the issues is that who, who rules the city? How is it? It's a uh, government, and uh, and uh, what should we do? One of the issues is that uh, I, I have a quote here from Ban Ki Moon, the former Secretary General uh, of of the um, United Nations. He said, "Our struggle for global sustainability will be lost or won in cities." Uh, and one thing is that cities are unlikely pushing to address the global challenge of the futures to set the agendas. Uh, as we see it, uh, we need a long-term and a strategic approach to our urban governance, our leadership and uh, the planning if we want to make this uh, change in the cities. Of course, there's a lot of international city networks uh, that have a very, very good focus and make a strong global force to make changes, but uh, we still have the question, do they think of all the future solutions that we need, can they be more explorative? We hope that uh, even the, a lot of them do a very good work. So it requires so many different actors to create a livable city and a, a regenerable city, and a lot of engagement from also the public to achieve these goals. Uh, and uh, as we say, when we talk about the sustainable development goals, leave no one behind. We have to get into this, all of us. So today, uh, many think that we just have to do a little uh, different in our daily behavior, uh, and we sure do have to, to do that, uh, but is it enough? If government well, cities can contribute uh, to global livable and uh, regenerative development. If government badly, uh, they will do the other side. Well, this has been in a case of, I think, over 30 years uh, since the Bundland uh, report was uh, was uh, announced. So why uh, the urgency now? Well, the 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 need to we need to just to think and to speak up, speed up, and make uh, this a uh, more dramatic transformation for the future if we wanted to change. Last year uh, we had the Earth Overshoot Day. Uh, on August 22nd, and that was the day where we have used all the resources uh, that the um, that the Earth is re regenerating. So, in fact, as uh, Lassa mentioned, uh, some estimates that about 65% of the UN SDGs, uh, there is uh, 169 targets that needs a local uh, involvement to be a success, and that's very important for us to uh, to see that that's why local governance is so important. Also, if you look into uh, some of the, the global deals, the UN New Urban uh, Agenda, the Paris Agreement of Climate, and, and a lot of the other uh, uh, deals, they all recognize the importance of cities and the local authorities uh, to make the uh, reaching all the goals that we have set up. So the question is, can and will mayors uh, save the world? Uh, can they do the di difference uh, that they have to do? Uh, can we do that in cities and how will they connect between cities uh, all over the world and uh, that's also one of the issues that we will look into it in the report. For us, uh, strategic urban governance is about interaction. Uh, as uh, Bruce Katz says in an interview in our report, cities are networks. The local governments have to address uh, new ways of uh, collaboration and interaction to bring all uh, along to come and change and uh, all the, um, the actors in the city have to be involved. So that's also, of course, includes the, the, the citizens. It might seem uh, sound easy for some. Uh, here in the Nordic countries, we have a lot of, of uh, good examples uh, how to do that, but I'm sure it's not easy for everyone and we still have a lot to, to learn here in the, in the Nordic countries. But we do have a good example. I think uh, I'd rather do a speech without mentioning the, the, the Finca plan. So when we look into uh, to building or expanding cities, we have to look into how they are connected with the, the hinterland. So this is a good example of such an urban development plan. Um, here is for Copenhagen, and um, where city planners all the way back in 1947 uh, make a, a long-term strategy called as you can see, a hand uh, where you can see the fingers. 
So the principles are that rather letting the city grow unrestricted uh, into an urban sprawl, all citizens should live close to forest and rural areas. The city and its service would only be allowed to grow in the fingers uh, along railways and uh, motorways. And between the fingers, we have the farmland and the forest. So nowhere in the city you do need uh, to cycle more than 15 minutes to get to a beach or forest or farm so you can get out and, and see some, some nature. Uh, and actually, uh, this is also one of the things that is very hot at the moment, as we also uh, write a bit about in the, in the report, is called the 15-minute city. It have a lot of uh, different names, but the most popular is the 15-minute city. But the, 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 the new hot is that we see the different ways of making smaller cities inside the big cities, as Les also talked about. This is getting closer. We don't have to take long polluting trips to, to get to work uh, uh, if we work from home or if we work from anywhere in the nature and we're shopping at the web and, uh, and live uh, dense. So the local hood will become more and more important for the livable city and uh, a big part of the change toward uh, a new purpose of, of the city. So. The conclusion uh, of the report is, is uh, we take some big, uh, big words in our mouth here. Uh, we, uh, we are talking about that we have to rethink uh, rather than improve, uh, shifting our focus from sustaining uh, to re regenerating, with the goal being to consume resources at a slower rate that the Earth ecosystems can recover them and knowing that it is not an easy task. So when we force this to uh, rethink rather, rather than improve, so it's uh, such a big shift. So we call it actually, uh, if we want to make regenerative cities, we call it the moonshot of our time. Uh, as I said, uh, this called for a new approach to urban leadership and governance and uh, a commitment and collaborative uh, involvement of of the many stakeholders that makes a city and makes a city livable. Uh, but it also called for all the companies to rethink what they actually are contributing uh, with and how they're doing. And uh, of course, of all the citizens, how they live and consume. So it's a change that we all have to take part in. Uh, but right now, we don't have the solution. That's why we call it a moonshot. Uh, we see a goal and uh, we see have to find a new path uh, to make solutions to get there but we still have to land on the moon and as we know from the 60s it could actually happen when we have these kind of goals so our plan is to make some uh, scenarios for the future uh, and uh, try to backcast uh, by developing a shared vision and uh, understanding of the future, we will start a collaboration to deliver the solutions and strategies that actually could take us there. We want to start a movement uh, that will allow us to face future generations and say we did everything in our power to move our cities against uh, regeneration. So hereby, uh, we invite you to join us to taking the first step. The similar question is, uh, how, and we want to address to you is, how can you uh, contribute to a regenerative uh, future? Of course, we are, uh, we don't just let that question stand open in, in, the, in the field. So we have actually made some, um, some suggestions uh, and some, uh, some good uh, example of, of how to do this. Uh, we have made this this three uh, three ways of making an, an engagement. The first one is more personal, to be a regenerative uh, pathfinder. It's a curse uh, you can take, uh, and uh, and we will uh, get you through uh, um, a different uh, way of learning techniques, of future studies, and uh, exploring potential uh, regenerative futures, and um, how you can find your role in in this future. The second one is the uh, organizational regenerative pathfinders. Uh, it's more uh, like a workshop with the purpose of identifying how your organization can uh, contribute to the moonshot of our time. How can you, uh, at your company or your organization, um, the, 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 the local government or others actually do um, 
and contribute. The last one is uh, we call it also an organizational representative, but it's a trailblazer. Here we just don't find the, the path, uh, but we'd like to make some partnerships uh, with, with some of you uh, with the purpose of allowing uh, your organization to help setting the agenda to be more regenerative and become the key uh, contributor in defining the mood short uh, journey of our time. So, so that's that's one of those. I'm just getting uh, what's the time? Yeah, um, just getting a bit closer to to the three things we um, we uh, have to uh, uh, we, we like to do. So, if you can see here on the screen that you uh, in the course of the more personal thing, uh, you can uh, will will explore potential uh, regenerative futures and uh, actually how you can find the role in this and um, you can uh, get some uh, insights about mega trends as we work a lot with here and we also like to explore the plausible futures as uh, lesser mentioned um, so you can also see that uh, we have um, well you can give some, some very good insights about uh, the, the potential futures in, uh, in how to make decisions and uh, you can have a, a view into a key drives of change uh, in the, yeah, the sustainability, the regeneratives uh, and the city agendas. So this is, this is how we'd like to, to, uh, to learn you and do that together in, in how uh, the agenda can shape the future cities. Um, so that that's, that's, that would be very very good course for for you as an individual. Uh, as an organization, uh, we are focusing on uh, trying to make a a workshop uh, with the purpose of identifying how you can how your organization can can be the contributor uh, to the moonshot. Um, and uh, and you will see uh, set the the direction of how your uh, your focus in the organization you have uh, can come and go beyond sustainability. That would be a big challenge for for almost all. Uh, so so that's um, that's it's a very big issue to to learn to work like that. But I'm totally sure that it would be a demand in in the future to work like this. So we just have to get started. Yeah. So uh, at the uh, at the end here, I will also say that we uh, we have this uh, trailblazer, uh, and uh, the ambition here is to. Uh, develop a, a bunch of scenarios uh, for the regenerative cities of the future. We want to explore the key challenges for the cities to achieve a state of regenerativity. So we, we invite you to be uh, to, to get a partnership here with us uh, and we uh, hope you will reach out and, uh, and uh, have a, a good chat about how, how you can do that. Uh, so you can be uh, one of these uh, trailblazers with us. So, even we are talking about the uh, pathfinders and have a good have a, some good pictures of people uh, using the path. Uh, so we 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 also have to uh, to say that if you if you don't go where the path may lead, uh, you have to go uh, where there is no path to leave a trail. That's our little uh, word uh, with, with the pathfinders and the trails. But it's because you have to be the agenda setter and. Um, being the one who leads the, the big transformation. So thank you uh, very much. That was uh, all for me right now. We now have some uh, good time for some discussion and some questions if you, uh, if you have that. Um, yep, thank you, Nicolai, and thank you, Lasse. We have time for some questions now, and I've been following the Q&A and chat, and we have some good questions coming in. So let's just jump right into it. The first one is from, maybe Nicolai, you could just change the slide to the next one. Yeah. Let's yeah. All right, here we go. So we have a question coming in from uh, Daniela who asks, I would be interested in understanding if you used a normative goal with backcasting strategy or forecasting with trends as the major paths for the definition of this future perspective. 
So I guess the question is for how we worked with the themes in this report. Did we choose a normative goal set in the future or did we look at current trends and try to, to work our way into, into the future? Perhaps that's a question uh, for you, Lasse. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, so, so usually we also work, uh, we always work exploratively where we say this is the, the possible um, future we are approaching. Um, and, and that has also been, been uh, the way we have approached this. We do not work with scenarios as such in, uh, in the report. We're just saying we see these clusters of driving forces. And we also see that some, some enablers and blockers, and, and we combine that in our analysis. Um, however, uh, there is one thing where, where also Nikolai mentioned a lot about the regenerative uh, cities. And we, we argue that uh, with the analogy from, from uh, Bill Gates that, that going to a, a carbon zero or a regenerative state, we need to go there. Some may argue this is normative, um, but we see that at, at some point in, in time, uh, it's not sustainable if we don't get there. The question is when we are going there, and and how so we actually take that as a as a premise uh, in our analysis that we need to go there eventually all right another question here from john who asks will the recent pandemic and possibly future ones put a break on the trends for enlarging cities so what will happen in terms of urbanization with the current pandemic and the risk of future pandemics as well um yeah i mean it's um the the pandemic uh, we, we started re writing the report uh, when the pandemic was uh, was here so uh, so we definitely believe that uh, it's a premise of uh, of urbanization uh we also do believe that uh, when we look at this in a historical point of view uh pandemic pandemics have uh, uh influenced urbanization but they haven't managed to stop it so we do believe that there will still be uh, forces uh, towards urbanization but of course in in some sense it's it's uh, it's taking off the the um, uh, some of the some of the push towards uh, urbanization and here's an interesting one uh, Judith asks, is the policy of regenerative cities alive in the countries who are expected to have the largest megacities by 2050? So I guess referring to your slide from the beginning, Les, uh, with the five biggest cities in the year 2100. So I guess the question is, um, where do we see this regenerative principle uh, having uh, the most uh, potential? And will it be will it be present in in the in the mega cities of the future as well? Well, I think that the that that the, the right now there's a long way, uh, but we actually see mega cities all over the world uh, looking into how to be more sustainable, uh, and uh, I'm sure that 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 some of them will do the thinking of how to do things better. That's also why we have the focus on uh, on livability because these things are going hand in hand. Uh, livability in, in a lot of uh, these mega cities is, is not quite that good um, in how, how, how uh, of course you see uh, the different ways in, in different countries and you, it's very important that you have the different cultures uh, and, and uh, what livability is, but, but a lot of places you see a lot of people living, uh, living very poorly. Uh, so, we, we do hope, of course, that it's uh, the, the large mega cities uh, by 2050 are, are thinking all of this. But if you don't uh, start now uh, and try to, to, to be the trailblazers, then we cannot, uh, I, I'm not sure that we're going there. Uh, a lot of the development right now is, is going the, the uh, opposite way. And here's one you will like, gentlemen. It's from Denise, who asks how how to become a key contributor to the regenerative trailblazer. Here we are partners with SIFS 
and I would like to learn more. Well, um, we will certainly have a link towards the end, as I mentioned, maybe 10, 20 times at this point, but uh, perhaps uh, Les and Nikolai, you could elaborate a little bit. Yeah, so, so as, uh, as Nikolai mentioned, um, the, the regenerative cities uh, is the moonshot of our time. So, so we do not see the solutions yet, but we do believe that it's unavoidable that we need to get there. So we need to find the solutions together. And we see a lot of solutions with a very narrow focus. Uh, we see a lot of ambitions towards doing it better. But what, what we lack out there is someone saying, this is the plausible scenarios of future regenerative cities. And that's what we want to, to create. Uh, and, and you can do it in a very overall level where you describe a city. But what is, in, what is interesting is when you dig into the, the more narrow fields uh, of how can it, a city within its uh, uh, mobility patterns and, and the way we, we, uh, we develop the infrastructure, how can that be regenerative? So we need to take it or we, we, we want to make the overall perspectives and then do deep dives within each uh, areas uh, and say, how can you con contribute to, to do this regeneratively? And, and that's what, the, I mean, on a personal level, that's what the course is focusing on, uh, on, on, on the path we are developing and, and how you can think about this holistically and in a futures oriented way. And then um, the trail placer uh, um, uh, track is based on co-creating some of these future scenarios within defined areas. Uh, so reach out, go into the web page and, and let's, let's have a more specific dialogue about this. All right, let's do this one from Balaji who asks, among the four main drivers of urbanization, shouldn't healthcare be included besides work, consumption, mobility, and communication? I'm sure pandemic has exposed uh, the vulnerabilities of livability in high dense urban sprawl. Um, on the other hand, it provides access to sophisticated and faster healthcare services too. So I guess the question is, where do, where do you see health and healthcare as it relates to livability in the future? Well, well one, one of the big issues uh, is, of course, uh, uh, not to get sick. It's one of the things that we're, we're working with here in, in the Institute, too. Uh, so healthcare is, uh, and health services, is, uh, is, uh, you can see it in, in two ways. One is that, the, that, that you have this healthy city where you uh, actually don't get uh, sick and we have to, uh, to make uh, a lot of uh, improvements of, of how we are together uh, and how close we are together to, uh, to make this change. But also, of course, uh, uh, speeding up being uh, how to actually get repaired, as I used to say, uh, when, when you are, uh, actually have an accident or get sick somehow. But, but of course, uh, healthcare is uh, very important and could be one of the, the issues uh, the next two, two the four hours. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and just to add, I, I mean, the four, um, four uh, dimensions I mentioned was more than this is where we see changes in the purpose of the city. Uh, and we do see that healthcare is something that previously, historically, has been preventing or slowing down the urbanization because living in the cities was actually uh, a, a worth for your health condition uh, than, than the rural areas. But this is a dimension that we foresee is changing, uh, at least in the more developed uh, part of the world. So you actually will search uh, towards the cities in, in order to get access to the healthcare, to get access to, to the ecosystems that will help you, guide you, nudge you towards uh, healthier lives. All right, I think we have time for a few more questions. Here's one from Sarah who asks, as far as agents of change, do you believe corporations and states slash policies, pol policy makers, I suppose, have equal or shared responsibilities regarding future change? 
with the framework of the current discussion theme. So, so I suppose, where do you see the balance between uh, the responsibilities of corporations versus states in making this transformation? Um, the, the way we actually see this is that uh, it's so, it's, we, we try to change the dialogue a little bit and not say who should we point towards to blame. Uh, also, the sustainability agenda is, is very much about uh, cleaning in front of your own doorstep, saying I'm, I'm, I'm trying to eliminate my uh, emissions and so forth. What we try to, to, uh, to create uh, is a movement uh, where we start asking the question, where can you contribute? So in, in this question, I would start saying, what can you as an organization do? What can you do as a government? What can you do as a, an individual? And then focus on your key capabilities. Focus on understanding the, the, the future, the regenerative future within your field, and then say, what can I do to contribute to the way out there where we will um, try to under, create an understanding of, of the, 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 the regenerative future and say, what could be the path out there and how can I be a, a contributor to that, both uh, in, in terms of, of understanding the way out there, but also developing the solutions, the partnerships and the um, incentives to, to get out there. All right, guys, let's do one final question here. This is from Sarah as well, actually. And she asks, what are the top three smart cities to watch? That's an interesting one. Do we have a... <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh... Well, what's, what's one, I guess? What's one interesting smart city to watch? Well, that that's also uh, requires a definition of, uh, of what is smart because uh, smart cities uh, in in some some ways are the digital way uh, when you look into the, the smart cities and then you can uh, can go to uh, to some of the, the Asian uh, cities as uh, as uh, Singapore and uh, and uh, some of the other parts actually. Uh, I think it was was this Ho Chi Minh City was just trying to make some some uh, drone taxes and so on. So it's, it's the technical part is is uh, very smart, but but actually when we discuss smart cities, we also talk about uh, livable cities. Uh, a lot of uh, the discussion in smart cities is how to get a more livable city. So so in fact, if you go to Barcelona and of course Copenhagen, uh, you can see some solutions that make it. Uh, smart in in the way that it's actually a nicer uh, place place to uh, to live in um and it also i can see there were some, some questions about the, the 15 minutes and how to do that it, it is this to getting uh, smarter but because you can have some solutions that's that is closer to you uh, and then where you live so yeah some asian singapore barcelona copenhagen um we have to make uh, mention Copenhagen, of course, but also uh, some of the other uh, Nordic countries have a lot of, of, of good uh, things to to come with. All right, and with that, we want to thank you all for tuning in, and for everyone who stuck around till the end. We will put up now on the screen um, the final slide uh, on which you can see the links to our urban futures initiative and where you can buy the report as well as where you can become a member of the institute for access to um, this report and to future reports as well finally there will be a qr code that you can use to subscribe to our newsletter it's completely free and it's full of uh, news on events free articles and other good stuff so the next time we will host one of these events you will have a uh, and notice well in advance so you can be sure to sign up and uh, yeah with that thank you all for tuning in and we hope to see you next time bye